The Help Show is a podcast dedicated to connecting individuals to mental health resources in the community. The Help Show is more than a podcast. It is a movement focused on change. Our objectives are to change the perception and stigma associated with mental health, encourage those with mental health disease to get help, foster access to mental health resources, and remove barriers to mental health resources, including those encountered in undeserved communities. We remain committed to supporting the mental health needs of the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. Though the world has changed dramatically in a short period of time, The Help Show is here to help and navigate through the changes and address your mental health needs. Seek help when needed. If distress impacts your daily life for several days or weeks, talk to a clergy member, counselor, or doctor, or contact SAMHSA Helpline at 1-800-985-5990. The crisis worker will work to ensure that you feel safe and help identify options and information about mental health services in your area. Your call is confidential and free. This podcast is sponsored by Good Coworking. Good Coworking is the first solar-powered co-working community in the world focused on cultivating profitable businesses that do right by the people plus the planet, all while keeping you safe in a beautiful plant-filled wellness center space. Get an address for your business, which comes with two daytime co-working days per month to get your meetings done, all for the quarterly cost of $150. Good Work have many membership options, from frequent flyer to office rental, so let Good Coworking help you find just the right space to help you balance your life and work. Located in Dallas, Texas, just south of Deep Ellum. Check out goodcoworking.co and tell them, The Help Show sent you. War is a reality of our modern times, but the current Russian invasion of the Ukraine has brought the trauma and insecurity of war refugees into the forefront of our Western society. We're watching people uprooted from their lives struggle with the trauma and displacement and the quest for survival. And the reality in the U.S. is that many of our fellow citizens are living today with food insecurity in a time of peace. They don't know where the next meal will come from. At least one in six people in North Texas is food insecure. And the food insecurity rate in Dallas County is 47 percent higher than the national average. The question I ask myself is, how does food insecurity affect one's mental health? Our listening audience needs to be aware of the issues that arise in our communities and educate them on locating resources. Today, we're going to discuss the complexities of food insecurity, war, and the lack of equality when it comes to who is most affected. And in our forefront is the question of how food insecurity and war affects the mental health of individuals from the effect of trauma and hunger of the brain. Today, we have a very special guest. Welcome, Dr. India. Stuart. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. This is my first podcast, okay, that I've recorded. So pretty excited to be here. And also, of course, to, to talk with the, everyone with you about this issue that is so, you know, so compelling in our community that we don't think enough about or talk enough about amongst ourselves. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for the invite. Oh, no problem. So I want the audience to know, because, you know, in the comfort of your home, you can watch us, but then you're listening to us. Tell us about Dr. India Stewart. Ah, Come on. Where do I begin? <laughs> okay, so let's see. So um, India Stewart, I am a, a doctor. I actually have my doctorate in public affairs and nonprofit management from UTD and also my master's in applied sociology from there as well. So currently I teach sociology. I'm a full-time faculty member at Dallas College, primarily at the Eastfield campus, but also you know, we do a lot now that we're one college amongst the, amongst the locations. And in addition to that, I try to do a lot of work in the community, particularly volunteer work around smaller nonprofit and uh, these food insecurity issues, equity issues. They're really my bread and butter. I've always been fascinated by how as a society we can unmake these systems and structures that we made. And so that's really... That's really my big thing. How do we create more equity? How do we build more for everyone absolutely. in this world? And food is a big part of that. Basic I'm, human right. Absolutely, absolutely. So I kind of want to start off with how war drives food insecurities. Okay? okay. So for those that are not aware or know what food insecurities are, what is what is a food insecurity like? Now, there's a lot of ways we can look at it. So we can look at a technical USDA uh, 
kind of definition of it. But really, when we're thinking about food insecurity, we're not just talking about people who are missing meals. We're talking about people who have no real sense of when and where their next meal is coming. How can they afford this? So it can even food insecurity can even manifest as maybe cutting back on meals or mm. purchasing the kinds of items that you can afford, but uh, may not be the best. You're not, you don't have the agency, the ability to make the best possible choices. And that's an aspect of it as well. In addition to just a technical, you've missed X number of meals right. due to a lack of access to those, those food sources. So it's almost like la a lack of nutrition. Yes, that's another way we can look at it, lack of nutrition. There's food everywhere. Absolutely. In fact, we're, you know, the wealthiest nation on earth to have such a large, you know, such a large insecure food unstable mm. population. And a lot of that comes down to infrastructure. We're going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does war um, affect the food supply? So, you know, I know and you know, and a lot of Americans know that there's a war going on with Ukraine and mm -hmm. Russia. And as we speak, what Russia has done, um, they have targeted their um, food resources, their grocery stores, and their hospitals. Right. Okay. So I want to talk about that capacity, but then I want to kind of roll it down what's going on in, in our city, what's going on in the D, <laughs> what's Absolutely. going on in Dallas. Absolutely. You know? So I want to be able to talk about it from a, um, a world capacity aspect of things, but mm -hmm. then also I want to talk about what's going on in here in Dallas. Okay, yeah. so when we look at, say, the food surprise, we look at this in a global sense. Okay. And particularly in the, in the context of the war with, uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine, targeting food supplies, targeting hospitals, that has been a time-tested, unfortunately, weapon of war, right? We know if people can't eat, if people are, if we create instability, right, then that is... It's unfortunately been used as, some would say terrorism, some would say a weapon of war. That's something that's often happened. But if we bring it down here, mm -hmm. right, where at least ostensibly, we're not at war mm -hmm. with one another. At least right. not that I'm aware, right? Me either. And yet, we have the same kinds of, maybe not targeted in a military sense, right. but in the way that structures are built. So the structures around who gets food, who has access to affordable, nutritious food, okay. and who doesn't based on things like redlining in communities, based on things like how investment shakes out. Those kinds of things contribute to a lot of that instability right here at home. So instability abroad and instability at home, they are, they're, they're parts of a whole, right? Okay. And so, Looking at that, so we know if anyone has tried to, tried to, because it's so expensive, <laughs> purchase gas lately, oh. then, then you know what I'm talking about, right? Absolutely. As prices go up, mm -hmm. what kinds of choices are we forced to make? It's not just how many trips will we not take, but is it trips to the grocery store? Yeah. Or are we purchasing items that, ah, this 99 cent menu, yeah. this might be what gets me through absolutely right now as, as prices increase even what the, the dollar store yeah the dollar store is not the dollar store no anymore. it's not they, false they advertising their prices <laughs> so that's one of the things they said well we'll help with this food you know it's right. like this food desert business by increasing the amount of food in a dollar store or a dollar general yeah but look at those prices going mm -hmm. up and look at the unit costs on those kinds of things and you're not really getting a great deal. Right. That's what, you know, that's what we have to do. Often people are put into those positions. What choices are you going to make? Right. It's like, okay, so instead of me getting, like, oranges and, um, and getting bananas mm -hmm. and those nutritionist things that, I, that can help keep me going throughout the day, because, you know, I, cause I look at it um, as... Like, I eat a lot of vegetables, and I eat a lot of seafood. So I'm, I'm, I'm like a pescatarian. Okay. And I went to the store. Okay? I'm very frugal. <laughs> All right. <laughs> very. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. $75? <laughs> what? <laughs> Use is like $50. Mm -hmm. So now my meal has went up 20. My food, going to the grocery store, like, once a week. 
Absolutely. $25. So now that's $25, $50, $75, $100 more. And now we take fewer trips. Yeah. So maybe I'm going to the store now maybe twice a month. Right. Because I got to factor in my gas. Absolutely. And then, you know, if you, with the inflation, right, if you didn't receive a raise that was more than the cost of living, yeah. you took a pay cut, yeah, and most essentially. Of, and most Americans have taken yeah, absolutely. a pay cut. You know, because we, we are in inflation right now and the cost of living has increased immensely. And there's no raises. Right. You know, I have plenty of friends that have jobs. No one has gotten a raise. <laughs> I can't recall the last time most of my friends have gotten a raise. <laughs> like, How do you spell that? <laughs> so, you know, you know I'm, I'm laughing, but it's just the way that the day of the time, mm -hmm. you know. So those that have Teslas, <laughs> we get it. <laughs> We're all thinking now, why didn't I get that hybrid car when I could afford it? Why? <laughs> right. Because who could afford it? And that goes back to those in not inequality issues, right? Absolutely. Can you afford the things that in the long run are going to be cheaper for you? Or even if you, you were at the yeah. store, right? And you said, okay, I'm going to get some nice oranges. But yeah. what about everyone who was at the store and said, mm, I can afford some orange juice? And then looked at those prices and suddenly it wasn't <laughs> simply orange. Maybe we need to get... Mm, you know, Tampico is very good, <laughs> right? Right. Don't do it. Everyone knows what the Tampico is, or the, you know, the hope. The what is it? A Hawaiian punch. Yeah. The fruit juice, and you look yeah. at the juice. Ten yeah. percent. It's sugar and water, and you know, but that's our food choices. That's our food choices, and that's a, that's what we, you know, we pretty much have to to choose from. So I want to talk about ways to protect against food insecurity and poor mental health. A little bit of that, and then we're going to go into um, redlining a little bit into um, food disparity communities and my most um, favorite one, food deserts. Ah, yeah, okay. that's my favorite one. We might be on there for now. <laughs> <laughs> so how, um, how would someone implement food education in the minority income neighborhoods? Oh, so we should start with the start with the tough one. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things, and we I think we have to. I'm a sociologist, so I'm always gonna I'm always gonna unpack that. So I think Absolutely. we have to unpack what we're talking about here. So if we think about food education, okay. to what extent do people know about these healthier choices? Right. right. So to what extent is this in the curriculum? Who took a nutrition class in high school or? college or at any point this is good for you this is less good for you right but then that also butts up against if we're talking about minoritized communities mm -hmm. what about cultural practices i don't know if, absolutely uh, sometimes maybe someone in the audience has seen there's a great documentary that came out a few years ago soul food junkies i think it was byron hurt i think yeah, uh, about was... our diets killing us and it's this is tradition. This is what we eat. This is our culture. And it, it tastes good. It, it does taste taste good. good. <laughs> but so how do we tell? Well, you know, Granny, <laughs> the, the way that you put those, you know, you put the neck bones in those greens and the, that is delicious. However, right. You are driving my pressure up. Right. So those two things, we have to kind of look at them together. What is the formal? What are the formal aspects of that? What do we know? Right. And then what do we know from culture? And then when you're thinking about minoritized and particularly low-income communities, it's great to say when you know better, you do better. Right. But there's also the aspect of you do what you can with what you have. Absolutely. When you have it. Right. So how do we unpack that? I, I, I would be a millionaire right now and I would share it all with everyone, <laughs> you know, if I knew how to parse out all of these issues. Right. So, but just kind of getting the word out. I, Obviously, shows like this one, and you know, there's nothing wrong with a good public service announcement. You know, I'm from the '80s, so it's always the more you know, right? <laughs> right, right. Those kinds of things. So there's information out there. Mm -hmm. How do we have people hunger, thirst for that information? Right. And how do we implement that with very, very limited resources? Also, right. and don't forget about the value of time as mm -hmm. well. So one of the things when we look at culture and eating habits, right? particularly when we're talking about a society where people increasingly have to work 
maybe two jobs. If you look at the minimum wage, you would have to have, I believe, 2.5 jobs right now. Right. At minimum wage to afford fair market rent just here in Dallas. So if you're working two or three jobs, maybe you're taking care of kids and right. all the things we have to do, you might know, yes, it is a much better idea. It's cheaper in the long run for me to make fresh food, but you've come home from two or three jobs and shift work. Absolutely. Right? Maybe you're driving the, an Uber. When do you have time right. to do that? So sometimes it is so much easier. I need to feed myself or I need to feed my kids or my whoever, and I need to do it now and as cheaply as, as possible. possible. Absolutely. So, so we're talking about 2.5 jobs. I can believe that. 2.5 the 2. last 5. time I looked, and that's just for fair market rent. And I think that was before, you know, we saw with the moratorium on uh, rent increases and evictions. <laughs> okay, that's done now. Yeah. And if you've noticed the, the news, those rents have skyrocketed. Absolutely. I was reading something, I think like 60% or something like that. Something, yeah, outrageous just in the like past two or three months. Absolutely. So going back to healthier foods, how can we make healthier options more accessible for low-income housing? So. <laughs> you, you got a good, you got a we've, good one? We've tried this. Okay. We, and then let's think about who we is in okay. this context as well, right? Okay. So when we're thinking about healthier options, a lot of it has to do with the siting of things. So okay. I know you and I were talking about grocery stores okay. the other day. So the kinds of inequities we see, they are part of the design, right? Okay. All of the things you see are the result of policy preferences. Right. Someone at some point or a large group of someone's decided this is what we should do. And it's usually someone's who have a bit more power, a bit more voice in a Absolutely. system. And so if there was a political will, if there was a will to say, yes, food, good, affordable, healthy food is a basic human right. Okay. Everyone deserves, I'm not even talking about a civil right, right? A civil rights based on, as a citizen, you should expect this. I'm right. saying as a human being who has been born, you should expect this, you deserve this in our society, right? Right. So if we say food is a human right, what kind of infrastructure do we have to make sure that everyone has access to that, huh. has access to that in the same kinds of way, so it becomes an equity issue? And right. there have been different interventions. So we know, for example, uh, the city. Then the city, this is not a knock on the city. They're doing a great job with the, uh, you know, the Resilience and Equity Office. But the cities had initiatives to subsidize nonprofit okay. grocery stores right. in then let's you know the southern sector. Yeah, that pretty much below yeah. thirty. We tend yeah. to we tend to see a whole different story. The story of Dallas is so much the story of above and below thirty. Yeah, but when we subsidize these things and then we don't see investment coming around it, yeah. how quick we are to give up to say you know what, I don't want my tax dollars to subsidize to save a lot anymore yeah. or you know, HEB is so great that you purchased all this land in uh, the southern sector. Right. But your new store is going to Frisco yeah. and Plano. And I yeah. think, what was it, uh, one of the councilmen say, that's like a slap in the face. It is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's political will and it's the design, the desire as a people. If we say this should happen, we can make it happen. You know, I just, I think we can. I know we can make it happen if everybody gets more on a, on a level playing ground. You know, we do put so much of our tax dollars, you know, in, in, in the food deserts. But then who wants to take on that project? That's the question. Who, you know, they're like, here, here's a million dollars. Here's the five million dollars. Mm -hmm. But no one wants to take on that responsibility because you know, the way that we eat, or are we gonna purchase those, or or, or who's gonna run the grocery stores um, accordingly and properly? Or, you know, who's gonna actually purchase from the grocery store, or they're gonna eat healthy? Because when I when I go, no disrespect, <laughs> gotta put it out there, when I go to Central Market, you know, I do see more people of color and minority in, the, in those places than I, than I saw three, four years ago. Oh, absolutely. Because people of color and minority, they're hungry for a better life. Absolutely. They want better health. You have grandmothers that are sick. 
that are trying to be healthier. You know, um, you just have a new generation that that wants to do better. Mm -hmm. But why is it that we have to continue to go to the Plano's, to the Frisco's, to, you know, Highland Park, to the Highland Park area, to those areas in order to, to just live an equality, equity type of life? That's so frustrating. You know, mm -hmm. I would love to live in in those areas, not that those areas, but like DeSoto mm -hmm. and, and Oak Cliff. But I always live in the north side so I can eat healthy. Mm. Why, why do I have to like pick between those two? Then that's a, I'm gonna give my flaming hot take here. Okay, <laughs> flaming hot, hit my, it. My flaming hot take <laughs> is, I think there's a perception Mm. And it's a long-standing perception based on some stereotypes, some observation that they don't want that, right? Mm. They don't really want to eat healthy. Or, you know, you're the exception that yeah. you want to go to these places and you want to do these things. Right. So I noticed even my, myself, and I'll say this as a person at Oak Cliff, that's my hood, okay? <laughs> but as an Oak Cliff person, I noticed when I moved, from you know, when I moved from East Dallas to Oak Cliff, Oak Cliff, yeah, I still I drive very very far Absolutely. to shop because the same store that I will not call out its name. I'm calling. However, <laughs> I have to go to a different branch of the same exact store to stock normal I things that will be normal items. What are normal? You. What are normal items to you? Produce that. Looks like it was picked at least sometime in the last month. <laughs> you know what? My that, friend, that's normal. My friend says this. He's like he does not buy any of his food, any, I mean, any of his meat in Oak Cliff. Absolutely They put not. so much dye on it. This is the conversation that him and I have extremely frequently. He's like, I have to come way where you stay, Nyetta, mm -hmm. in your area, in your neck of the woods, in order to get fresh um, produce, to get healthy meat. And it's just like... That's when I look at the food deserts, and, and that's I, before you get to the the uh, healthy items in like say bulk. We're just talking about regular stuff, produce, meat. I'm not talking about my specialty stuff. Like I like my acai juice. It's delicious. It's good for you. It's full of antioxidants. Yes, it is difficult to find <laughs> my acai <laughs> juice in Oak Cliff. Like, what kind of place are you running here? You don't have acai juice? Oh, I'm out of here. <laughs> Right, <laughs> right. But I can get three different brands. Yeah. If I go to Mockingbird or above. Yeah. And it's a, it's this perception. Yeah. Why would I want to build a grocery store there for people who don't? You know, they don't want that. They want you know takis and hot Cheetos, which are delicious. They are delicious. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> but if that's not all we want, and there's that Absolutely. perception. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to go into the food deserts in minority communities. Okay. Okay. So why do low-income communities have less access to the healthier food grocery options as compared to the more affluent communities? So we spoke about it very briefly a few seconds ago, mm -hmm. but I kind of want you to dig a little bit deeper and dive with that. Okay. So when we're looking at that, and I think I mentioned a little earlier, mm -hmm. it's almost like a, a redlining, or sometimes we, we hear it called not a food desert, food apartheid, mm. right? When we're talking about Apartheid, and I have to say that was a, I think that was a Freddie Haynesism. That was not me. I don't want you know anyone to think that I made up food apartheid. I did not. All right, I'm not taking from, not taking from him. Not Sorry, for Pastor. Whistle. But <laughs> you know, but when there are separate apartheid, that means there's separate systems. Right. And so this food apartheid is really just a manifestation of that same apartheid that we see everywhere. So when we look at things like housing, yeah. Right. Where is housing built? What kind of quality of housing is there? Mm -hmm. We don't have to have legal, the jury segregation anymore. We have de facto segregation mm -hmm. to the extent that there's this impression, well, they would feel more comfortable mm -hmm. around people who are more like them, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it just, no one's saying you can't be here, mm -hmm. but you know, all of your people are there and wouldn't you prefer it? Yeah. But why are all of your people there? Yeah. Well, because we used to have redlining that kind of ruined communities and then once you have redlining and communities where you can't get uh you can't get a loan from fha 
Mm. Right. That's they literally drew a red line mm. around areas on the map and said, these places are not a good credit risk. The people who live in these neighborhoods, they're distressed. They won't pay your loan back. So yeah. we can't loan in these redlined areas. Right. They tended, and if you look at an overlay, there's some great stuff on the city's website. Mm-hmm. If you look at an overlay, those same redlined areas where the housing is poor are also the same places where the unemployment is high, are also the same places where if you look at the environment, so just the environmental justice part of it, where all the plants are belching out steam and garbage, and then these neighborhoods are distressed, well, let's run an interstate right through the middle so that people are broken up from their natural helping networks. Mm. And then, well, it's easy to have these apartheid conditions because, well, why would we invest here? This place is falling apart. Absolutely. Why would I bring my grocery store here? So instead, why don't we have many gas stations, mm. right? And maybe if you, there's an apple, it's got, you know, you just scrape this wax off. You can still eat it. It's yeah. fine. Or so liquor stores. Liquor store, yeah. Liquor stores. Liquor store, gas station, family dollar, dollar. And it's just the dollar stores. But they cater to a very specific market selling the same items but at an inflated price. But if you have poor public transportation, right, and you look at the city's equity plan part of it is transportation right the system's not serving people as well as it could or should right well you got to get what you can when you can right and if i'm on the bus i can't go out to plato or rockwell or anywhere like am i gonna bring it back on the bus and then sometimes they don't have transportation systems in those areas so i I by design so i they're targeting a certain certain demographic Mm -hmm. and and that's how i i I truly look at it they are you know I don't, can you catch a bus to Frisco? Not directly, but it has expanded. It has expanded a lot. But for a while, remember, Arlington was the largest city that didn't have real a public transportation system. Right. The largest one, or there were, and this was a while ago, but it was a big problem. Plano didn't want to really be part of the DART expansion as right. much because, oh, if we have this train, it'll be so easy, right? Yeah. You just jump on the train at Fair Park come up to Plano, right. and uh, that was a, we would joke about it when I was in grad school. What do you think they're going to do? Come steal your big screen television and take <laughs> it back with them on the train? <laughs> right. You know, I just, so it's, all, it's all a part. It is a part. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I can't fuss, I can't kind of fuss with you about that. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's all part of the same thing, and it's, it's by design. We made these systems. We made these structures. They're right. based on ideas. ideas Who is we? About, we as human beings. So I don't know that I wouldn't say that we're all equally. We don't okay, all have equal I, power. I don't know who is we in making this. I was, uh, I was, I was not part yeah. of it. Okay, it's not. But we as humans, right? We as okay. humans, we do. We we express our policy preferences, right. or we don't when we don't vote, or we don't take the time to educate ourselves. Absolutely. I mean, Google is full and free. And yeah. if you are, uh, she sits around all day. She wants to answer your questions. If you are shy, this is what I tell my students also, if you are shy and you don't want to ask Google, ask Siri or Alexa to ask Google for you. <laughs> right? Right. That's true. That's true. If we don't do it, who will? So I want us to roll back about the pandemic. Okay. So how has the pandemic impacted food access? Because right now it's just got pandemic, got war, but <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of... Um, it's a real what next? Yeah, what's going on? So how has the um, pandemic impacted, you know, food access? I think in some ways the pandemic, if we're looking for some kind of bright side, and it's, it's really hard to look for, but it's highlighted mm-hmm. some of those things that were there uh-huh. and it kind of surfaced some of that suffering. Because if you, you notice, it seems like every week there's another food giveaway, food drive, fill the pantry yeah. in a way that wasn't happening on the same level. As right. previously, but of course it's it's exacerbated everything because we have the you know jobs. Yeah. How many people lost their jobs? How many people got sick? How many people? We, we can't even talk about this without talking about. Okay, what about the health insurance? Who has it? Who doesn't have it? Right. How does our diet impact? You know, when we looked at uh, what COVID nineteen, one of those indicators was if you had a pre existing condition, so things like. Uh, overweight, obesity, if we had things like asthma, all these kinds of things, 
many of which are partly environment or diet. Right. And now there's a pandemic. Now you have people getting sicker and sicker. Right. And who do we put on the front lines in your grocery store? Yeah. Who are the essential workers? Yeah. So there you go. I mean, it all keeps coming back to the same place. Yeah. That, you know, that is true, you know. I, you know, I thought the pandemic, um, honestly, I think it, to a certain extent, made everybody look at their lives extremely different when it comes to, like, food insecurity and being healthy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, the gro- not the grocery stores, but, like, the vitamin stores <laughs> were sold out of vitamins. Mm-hmm. Because people were like, you get some vitamin D, you get some C, D, E. Just give me the alphabet. Just give me everything off the shelf. <laughs> And then what I did see, I, I did see more people um, of color change the way that they ate, mm-hmm. um, the way they looked at food. Um, I feel like to a certain extent, there still was inequality and equity in, in food um, being serviced um, amongst the um the the southern sector Mm -hmm. but i do think that um people were more knowledgeable and people were were wanting to feed their mind and their body with healthier options definitely and so with the pandemic it was a negative because it um those that had low immune system Mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't do too well or they didn't make it yeah Absolutely. But those that received another chance, a lot of people change the way that they live in their life. I so, definitely agree. And I know some people like that yeah, who, with so, COVID, hey, I, I got to do better. I got to yeah. really evaluate what's important to me. Because when we talk about food insecurities, we, the first thing we say is nutrition. Mm-hmm. But, but with food insecurities, when it comes to nutrition, when people, you know, it starts way back over a hundred years with slavery. You know, um, the slave master ate really great mm-hmm. and we ate the pig feet. We ate the inside of a pig. We ate everything that was unhealthy and, and made it taste good. And so what has happened is, is that in mm-hmm. my opinion, what I've seen, it just kind of went generational. It just, it just, okay, well, my mom ate it. Your grandmother ate it. She fine, you know. Yeah. Well, let's give it to your cousin. Let's give it to mm-hmm. your uncle. And so I just feel like we have to break that generational curse. Mm. And we have to do better when it comes to feeding ourselves and putting the proper nutrition in our body. So right. sometimes with having food insecurity, it has a lot to do with, with the economical, the finances that come behind it. Right. But then also I feel that you come to a point where it's the knowledge behind it. And the question is, do you want to do better? Do you want to or can you? Or can you? That culture piece, though, too, because, well, yeah, yeah, I was like, well, Granny ate it. Yeah. You know, your uncle ate it. Yeah. And we don't talk about her pressure or her yeah. sugar. No. And, and so much in culture, food is love, mm. right? So you go to the, the cookout, the family reunion, or you go over for dinner, and you know, you turn to, oh, okay, so you're too good for my food now. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then... So then that becomes a problem, too. Or you want to tell me to change these recipes? Right. It, is, it made you healthy. Now you too, yeah. So I get it. That's so I, I think instead of getting that big plate, let's give me a little baby plate. <laughs> you know. Um, so we're getting, we're, we're getting ready to kind of close out um, of the show. Um, but I do want to talk about ways to educate yourself about food disparities in communities. And I want to be able to talk about, um, like, what organizations can you go to in order to learn more about food disparities, number one, and how can we get our voices heard by the local um, politicians with regards to our food um, deserts? Okay, all right. So first of all, of course, with the education piece, I'm always Google full and free. Okay. Use discernment though, right? Okay. There's misinformation and disinformation. So do we have the critical thinking skills to know that I don't know that Billy Bob's opinion <laughs> blog and pig feetarium is the place where I should get my, you know, get my info. So okay. making sure we're looking at things like CDC has a very good the Centers for Disease Control. They have a very good one. If you look at the USDA, 
Mm -hmm. You can actually Google USDA and put food desert or food insecurity in there, and they give you a wonderful food access map. Okay. In addition, uh, USA also, or USDA, rather, okay. they also uh, work with Healthy People 2030, so it looks at the social determinants of health. Okay. And so they give like a lot of resources about that on kind of a larger level. Okay. On a more local level, the city is doing a lot with the equity and uh, the racial equity audit and the uh, equity plan and things like that. So if you look at the uh, Office of Equity, if you look at the Office of Resilience, and it's kind of underneath that, but they give a lot of really great information about here's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's I think a key word is trying. trying yeah. Right? If you go to We Are One Dallas, you'll see get involved, get involved, get engaged. But yeah. we actually have to get engaged <laughs> in order for that to happen. Right. And then that also kind of ties into that, how do we make our voices heard? And uh, well, obviously, I'm, I'm going to say vote, vote, vote. They wouldn't be trying so hard yes, to just make it so hard yeah, just if it wasn't important, yeah. right? But not just at a, a larger level, but what about your your council person. And so if you, you know, live in the, the southern sector like me, you need to, hey, uh, you know, Casey Thomas, I, I, I need to know what's going on over here by Redbird. Uh, Carolyn King Arnold, I've noticed that this Kroger or other store by my house, it may not be Kroger. I don't want to put anybody out, but yeah. I noticed that it's always, you know, filthy and nobody and they don't have good food. Aren't you working on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, you're the people who are supposed to represent you. Absolutely. Hold them to represent you, not a stereotype mm -hmm. of you or what they think you want, yeah. but you, we're not a monolith. And so holding people, holding people accountable. Absolutely. That's the word for today. Accountable. <laughs> but, you know, I feel like accountable. <laughs> <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> well, hope everyone enjoyed the guest today and sees that the community issues that we must all be aware of. The Help Show aims to emphasize how crucial it is to raise our voices in our communities. We want everyone to realize how important food is to our mental health as well as our bodies. We hope today you realize how imperative it is to push our politicians to take action on behalf of our low income work, our areas. Thank you so much. The Help Show wants to thank all of our partners, Auckland Research Associates, NJI Holding, Good Co-working, Gift in Mind Foundation, Duke's Hair Studios. We'd like to take a moment and thank everyone in our listening audience for listening today. we also like to remind everyone that we are a nonprofit organization operating entirely off the generous support of our donors. If you'd like to give to our organization, we appreciate you. You can send your donation via Cash App, Money Sign, The Help Show, or on our website at www.thehelpshow.org. There's no donation too small. Every dollar given will strengthen our efforts. If you'd like to donate $1,500 or more and become a VIP sponsor, then we have some additional packages listed on our website. And you can visit us at www.thehelpshow.org for more details.